welcome everybody. We're uh, grateful for your patience. We're just getting the last technical details uh, set up for you so we can give you the best demonstration possible tonight. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. This is such a great fall dish. These are great people that we have on this, this, uh, this session. So I'm Erin Drain with Ole and Obrigado. And I'm gonna be here tonight helping you uh, make sure that your chat box questions get to the right, you know, the right person that they get answered. Um, you will notice that your ability to turn your camera on and off is off at the moment, but we will let you do that a little bit later because uh, we'd love to see your faces and see what you're up to and if the dish, uh, if you especially if you made it in advance. So please do use that chat box, ask your questions. Um, and we are going to have a great session tonight. This is our first Portuguese themed uh, Ole and Obrigado experience. So I'm thrilled that we're here. We have real live Portuguese chef and sommelier with us too. So I'm just going to quickly introduce everybody and then ask uh, everybody to kind of speak about themselves a little bit later. Um, so we have Patrick Mata, co-founder of Ole and Obrigado. You might recognize him if you've joined our experience mm -hmm. before. We've got Sam Chapel Sokol from World Central Kitchen, who has also joined us. This is his third Ole and Obrigado experience. We're raising money tonight for World Central Kitchen. So thank you so much for your support. We'll give you a link that you can donate additional funds if you feel, if you feel uh, so moved later on. Uh, we've got Bruno Almeida, a dear friend of Ole and Obrigado, Portuguese uh, sommelier author, uh, all around rock star, drummer, I think. Yeah, he does it all. So we're gonna be listening to him tell us all about the world of Portuguese wine tonight. And of course, the incredible chef, George Mendez, who's joining, joining us from his home kitchen, just like we're cooking in our home kitchens. Uh, he wanted to give us an authentic experience and it's his recipe that we're doing tonight. So welcome all of you. That's right. um, I wanna just thank you all and we'll get started. We've got about 15 minutes at the end of this session for kind of a Q&A question. So that'll be the social time, uh, but keep the questions coming throughout. So first I want to introduce Patrick Mata to talk a little bit about Ole and Obrigado and these experiences and what we do. Um, I do also want to encourage you to start drinking wine now. There's no reason to wait. We're gonna, we're gonna be talking in depth about the wines during the second half after the food demo, but you should not hold off. We'd love to hear what you're drinking. If you have, if you have something in your glass, tell us what it is. Um, and we are drinking, we are going to discuss a white wine and two reds tonight. And that's really exciting. We'll talk a little bit about why. Uh, you're welcome to start with any of them uh, that you so desire. But we'll probably talk about the Toriga Nacional first, because that was the wine specifically suggested with the dish. And then the white wine and then the Masamita Tinto last, just if you're going to taste along with us. So without any further ado, let me introduce Patrick really quickly uh, to tell you all a little bit about ourselves and this this series. Well, thank you, Erin, and thank you, everyone, for joining. This is our 12th episode, and um, this is, you know, our way of giving back and give a voice to very important causes that make the world a better place. And also, it's our way to help people get to know um, the wines, the artisanal wines that we import into the U.S., and how to best uh, learn to enjoy them with food. Um, this is uh, Olean Obrigado experiences is a great way to get to know uh, authentic recipes from Spain and Portugal. And, you know, we're very excited today to have George Mendez with us and to cooking one, one of the quintessential dishes of, of Portugal. And, you know, uh, since we started our company, we have raised over $700,000 for different causes. There are different uh, ways for us to raise funds for these uh, charitable organizations. Uh, we have uh, a wine called Liquid Geography that donates 100% of the profits to, to different charities. We uh, introduced a new wine uh, last year under the same label of Liquid Geography that donates 50% of the profits to the World Central Kitchen. And we also do different events and different experiences that donate 100% uh, of the ticket sales. And that's so far how we've gotten to $700,000. And, you know, we cannot understand our work without giving back, uh, not only to important causes, but also to the producers that we represent, and also to you who are here today. We're, 
you know, offering you uh, an opportunity to learn about these great artisanal wines, but also great food. And investing time uh, to learn about food and wine is a great investment because the more you learn about pairing wine with food, the more you enjoy your food and your wine. So this is what we're here to do today. Thanks, Patrick. We definitely encourage you to play with your food and your wine always. Uh, and we love to share these experiences with you. So before we get into the food demonstration, um, you know, speaking of giving back, I do want to uh, hear a little bit from Sam about the work of World Central Kitchen. Sam's going to tell us a little bit about the organization, and then we'll be back on at the end to talk about some of the recent efforts that the, the World Central Kitchen has been doing um, in many different parts of the world. So Sam, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your experience with the organization, and, and what you guys are all about? Absolutely. So first off, thank you all. Thank you all for supporting uh, our work through events like this. You guys at Oleana Borgato have uh, been huge supporters of our work over the years. So we're always really um, appreciative of that. We were founded more than 10 years ago in 2010 by the chef uh, Jose Andres, a great Spanish American chef. Hopefully many of you know, and um, hopefully even more that you've gotten to taste his food in DC, in New York, in LA, and now Aaron in your backyard in Chicago. We're just opening up, very exciting. Um, World Central Kitchen provides nutritious and comforting meals to communities during and after natural disasters and other crises. Uh, and we also do work after the crisis, after the disaster, to invest in local food systems um, in order to kind of build resilience and uh, long-term support into the food system. Um, we got, you know, we got our most famous moment after uh, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico in 2017, after which we cooked more than 4 million meals in the next seven months. And since 2017, we've served something between 50 and 60 million meals after hurricanes, volcanoes, wildfires, earthquakes, refugee crises on I think five or six continents and obviously throughout an entire global pandemic. Um, my role, I'm the editorial director with the organization and a writer. Um, I worked with Jose for five years. Um, I've worked also, I'm one of the, the resident wine people at the organization. I've worked in natural wine, I've worked in champagne um, and for a spell during Two administrations ago, I was a pastry chef at the White House back in 2012 to 2014. So thank you all again for the support for World Central Kitchen. Um, I won't take away from the fun uh, part of the night when we get to drink some good wine and, and make some great food. So thank you all again. Thanks, Sam. I think we're going to need to do a pastry experience with you in 2022 and pair. That's what I was thinking. Cast, That's what I was thinking. out of the bag. <laughs> I think we could bag. do that. I, I, I saved that for my third time with you guys. Thank you. Thank I don't you. know what will happen on the fourth one. <laughs> Better wait. So, um, Chef George Mendez, you selected World Central Kitchen to be the beneficiary for this session. Um, and so, you know, it feels like the right moment to hand hand things over to you to tell us about yourself, about your incredible, fairly new restaurant. You, you opened a restaurant in this crazy time. So we would love to hear about it. And we'll uh, be showing everyone a link QR code so they can actually go make a reservation right now at Miranda. Um, so if you could tell us about yourself and about your restaurant and let's start the cooking demonstration. Sure, um, such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and and this, is, this is always a lot of fun cooking from home. Uh, it's a very intimate environment. So yeah, um, Chef George Mendez, um, I've been in New York City now for, oh my gosh, 26 years. I was born to Portuguese immigrants in a very small Portuguese community in Danbury, Connecticut. Um, and just to cut to the chase, I was born, raised to salt cod. Um, I think it was in my baby bottle, pureed with the milk. Um, it's just, I, I just grew up with very rustic uh, Portuguese cooking. Uh, salt cod was one of the most popular bounties on the table um, two times a week, simple with potatoes, a hard boiled egg, olive oil and vinegar. Um, I still have so many vivid childhood memories of my dad digging into the pot. And I would, I, my favorite part was breaking the hard boiled eggs and eating the egg whites. Um, I didn't enjoy salt cod until later on. So uh, fast forward till after high school, I uh, enrolled in the Culinary Institute of America and that's where my um, journey began to being a chef. Um, in the 90s in New York City. Um, and then I started taking trips back to Portugal and Lisbon and fell in love with the cooking and really started to look at it and through a modern lens. Um, and then I opened Aldea in 2009 um, and had Aldea for 
uh, 11 years. Um, and then just as the pandemic was beginning, I closed Aldea and now right as the pandemic is starting to, like maybe we're starting to climb a mountain maybe or come over to the other side of the mountain, um, I opened up Veranda um, in Soho, which is a continuation of my, my Portuguese cooking, but a lot more global influence, um, a lot more approachable dishes. Um, but my, my uh, blood, bones, and DNA of my Portuguese background is still very prominent uh, throughout the menu. Um, so, yeah, here we are. And you know, I'm live from Williamsburg, Brooklyn, cooking uh, salt cod. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Bruno, I'm sure you also grew up on salt cod. Is that your experience, too? Oh, a lot. Mainly it would be like during Christmas. Like um, um, most of my memories of cod would be during Christmas because like I you know, just the background of my family, like we would eat like a, a great piece of cod, like salted cod. And like, remember, remember my mom, like uh, uh, soaking the, the, the cod for two, three days. And I would be watching him asking, why are we doing this? Like, why can we eat this? But, you know, like, but the, the, the dish that we're having, I'm so thrilled right now, because I think it's a great example of, um, of the comfort food that our take that we have for this dish and screams volumes to me, like, and uh, it's a beautiful dish. I'm super stoked like for this. Awesome. Um, well, that's a great point, Chef. This this recipe does take a few days to prepare for. So if you want to run us through the steps uh, that you offered in your recipe before you tell us kind of how to cook it. Yeah, sure. So yeah, it, if you want it, if you want to cure and and uh, desalt the cod yourself, um, it does take a few days. Uh, you know, to change the water and get rid of the saltiness. Uh, of the cod, but there's also ways of buying uh, salt cod online. It's already been desalted and soaked for you, so it's ready to cook. Um, there's very outlets. Um, I love the sum of parts, meaning buying the raw ingredient, the, the raw ingredient, and then going through the whole process of manipulating it into a new texture. And I think uh, that's something that I did many years at Aldea is buying cod, reading about it, researching it, watching it transform into this very mild, from a very mild, flaky, bland fish into something that was like the meat of the sea because when you add the salt, it takes on a different texture. Um, you dry it, right? And um, what was once this very bland, soft, almost lifeless, lifeless uh, fish, now it has a lot more character. The salinity comes out. Um, it has a lot more bite, it has a lot more chew. Um, so that's, that's, that was a really fun uh, little project to do over the years. And it's very something you can do at home, is buying cod filet, buying salt, and weighing the cod the recipe is in my book but you're basically weighing the filet of cod and you're adding 20 percent of its weight salt and you're leaving it in salt for up to two days after that you brush the salt off and then you soak it in water for three days changing the water every day in, in the refrigerator or in a cool environment a seller will do uh just as fine if, if you don't have space in your refrigerator um and from there forward you just from there you can cook the cod which i have uh, cooked in a confit and olive oil. Confit is a fancy term meaning to cook in fat. Um, and I basically uh, chose to do it in oil because I had to fry potatoes as well. So why not utilize both? So um, we can boil the salt cod in water um, or cook it in water or we can cook it in milk. Um, it's also very common, um, which is another part that I'll get into in the recipe is you can cook the cod in milk and then you're going to add the milk later on in the recipe. And I'll talk about that. So um, I'm ready to begin. Bruno, you want to start talking about the wines a little bit? Yes. Um, so we actually, the first one that we have, uh, we're going to go all the way. I hope you guys can see on my Portuguese t-shirt that I have right here. We're going to go. That's way. clever. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. We're going to go all the way to Vinho Verde. Uh, so we have um, Asnella. Beautiful white. And... Uh, some of you, if you know about what I'm, I'm, we're a big Portuguese wine enthusiast and wine advocate for poor wines of Portugal, but mainly in the Vinho Verde, I think has been um, a true force of, uh, of nature, bringing a lot uh, of Portuguese wines that really embracing and exposing uh, a lot of the, the, the great potential of the region and Portuguese wines. And mainly because we, as you know, we don't drink that much of, red, of white wines in Portugal. Like it's only in the past 20 years we start drinking more white wines. And Vinho Verde always brought, has been bringing that 
approach of the white wines that uh, opened up the palate across the country and actually opened up a lot of doors for Portuguese wine in general. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of the region. And we have a great example today about talking a wine that a lot of perception may think that Vigno Verde is going to be a little fizzy and a little spritz on the tip of the tongue. This is not the case. And it's actually coming from a very um, rustic part rustic parts of the region from Bashto, from one of the nine sub-regions, which is right here, and it's closer to the Douro. So we're not talking about a sub-region or a part of Vino Verde and a part of Minho that it's coastal. It's actually not coastal, it's more inland. So it's a different perspective. And as chef, you, you, you know this better than anyone, actually Minho, they don't actually eat a lot of fish, they actually eat more meat, they're more meat driven. And a lot of times we think, oh, mean, you know, seafood and fish, but actually the region is more like, probably if they eat fish, it's the lamprey, lambreia, uh, but it's more like actually uh, through, um, more focused on red meat. So we have a great expression of terroir with, uh, with this wine. And why? Because we have two amazing varietals. There are two, um, Arinto for me, it's very special because I was born and raised in Lisbon and Arinto is in Bucelas when you're landing. Everyone listen, when you're landing in Lisbon, Bucelas is like right there, like you like just watching, uh, seeing the, the vineyards in Bucelas, it's 20 minutes away from, uh, from, from Lisbon, but Arinto it's the king coming from this sub region in Lisbon. So Arinto it plays a big place in my heart, like that's what brought me to drinking white wine in Portugal a lot. So, but you see it across the country and you see it in Vinho Verde. What it brings to the table, green apple, crisp, very focused, sharp, great minerality to the wines. And then in the meantime, you have one of my favorite varieties in Portugal not right now called Loureiro, which resumes a little bit to the folklore of laurel, the bay leaf, Loureiro, Louro, because it's very reminiscent of bay leaf. Mm -hmm. And it's the king, it's not, not the king, it's a rising star right now in Portugal, Loureiro. It's been like a blending variety, but nowadays it's seen being blended with Erintu, uh, which is actually called in the region called Puderna in the Vinho Verde, but blended with Alvarinho. Of course, it's normally blended with Alvarinho, but you might see Erintu like being expressed in most of the region, mainly in the south of, of Minho in Vinho Verde, but Loreiro, it's more like, it's more like, a, it's, it gets better, like they're being close to the coast by the Lima and Sosa, mainly in the Lima sub-region. When it comes over here, we have a transition of the granitic soils that are very predominant in the region, we have a transition to schist. So schist, you know, it reflects more and more heat. It's a different terroir. So we have a different side, which is, I think it's beautiful in the wine, expressing a different character and a different profile of Loreiro and it into a little more robust, a little more weight to it. And I think it's great uh, for them, for great with the dish so far, what I tested so far. So that's what we have. Yeah. It's uh, over into and Loreiro Agenella right now. Perfect, perfect wine for people that like Sauvignon Blanc or Sancerre or uh, Pinot Grillo, right? It's a crisp, uh, light, low alcohol, very, very good acidity, no? And a little bit of minerality. It's a great wine because like Loreiro brings that fragrant quality that a lot of people might associate with Sauvignon Blanc. It's very, um, as that jasmine, as that kind of acacia, white flower, orange blossom. It's like when you have Loreto on its own, it's like you're walking in the garden. And when you walk in the vineyards of Loreto, it's like, boom, you can't feel like, you can't smell Loreto. And then the Rinto, it's very sharp. It's very used for blendings across the country because of that sharp, beautiful acidity, beautiful potential to age. But what we've been learning lately with Loreto, it's actually has potential to age as well. But it's something that's fairly new that we've been learning probably in the past 10, 15 years, that Loreto can age as well. In Nuestros Hermanos in Spain, they call it Loreira. In Portugal, we call it Loreto. So, but it's a beautiful wine. It's very versatile. I like the pairing so far, but I think we can go from fish tacos, we can do uh, Indian food, we can do uh, um, Thai, we can do sushi. Middle Eastern falafel, sushi, uh, we can do white meat, we can do a little pork in a creamy sauce, I think uh, shrimp tempura, which I love, uh, coconut shrimp, so there's a lot of things I think we can do with this wine. Very cool, well let's check in with Chef, um, obviously we're pairing this with, with Boglia Bras, this rich kind of olive oil soaked salt cod dish. So I'd love to hear about what steps come next, Chef. And we did have a question 
from the audience about what to do with all of that extra oil if you're confined. Sure, sure. So um, that oil can then be used for other applications. You can make vinaigrettes. You can save it to cook um, other fish in the future to poach uh, other fish like salmon, for example. Um, it, it stays in the fridge uh, for up to two weeks. We utilize it at the restaurant um, for uh, various applications and vinaigrettes mostly. And of course, we, we confi a lot of cod at the restaurant. So we will um, definitely save the oil until, you know, you can see when it begins to turn, it has a lot more of the, the proteins, the albumin that releases from the fish gets dispersed into the oil, uh, into the oil itself. So there's come, there comes a time when you're going to know it's time to, to discard it. Um, on that note, that's why I, I do like to cook the cod in milk. So what I have here is a regular whole milk that I have the uh, salt cod uh, cooked in there at a really low heat, probably about 180 degrees, you know, very, very, not, you know, nowhere near bubbling, nowhere near boiling. So you have full control and you just want to cook it until you can easily pierce a knife through it, or you can pull it out and, uh, and flake it. So that's, what I did here, I have the cod. You can see the skin has been removed, all the bones have been removed. Okay, and then I'm going to put it on a cutting board and I can literally just use the fork and break it into flakes. Okay. About how large is the piece that you're working with today? It's about a four ounce piece. Okay. And you figure this can feed, you know, two people, as, a, as an appetizer or one person as an entree. So that's it, you can, you can see that cod, you know, just broke up into pretty large flakes mm -hmm. like so, okay? Then I have a uh, pot, medium low heat, olive oil, and then I'm gonna add my garlic and then shallots, right? A lot of recipes can call that a lot of the Portuguese recipes, there's onion. Uh, sometimes they don't use anything at all. They just use olive oil. Um, okay. Totally up to you. Of course, garlic is probably the most common um, Portuguese staple. You know, that's something I, I, I don't believe in Portuguese cuisine without garlic in it. Uh, so this is definitely a very important step. So I just want to let the garlic bloom in the olive oil. So you start to get the aroma. Wish we had about smell thirty seconds. For yeah, we have. We don't have that technology yet where you can actually smell things through your phone. Wouldn't that? Wouldn't that be great? And you're cooking that garlic in, in regular olive oil. Yeah, extra virgin olive oil. That's right. Okay. And then I'm adding the cod. For for how long did you cook the the cod on the oil? It was cod in the oil was about slow low heat about. 10, 12 minutes. You really get that aroma. I'm gonna add a little bit more olive oil. And I think with the, the cod as a protein and as a dish, I think in, in, even with this dish, I think it's very interesting how the takes go from the south all the way to the north. And even it's interesting how uh, George, you know me for uh, since Pound, since a long time in the early 2000s, and uh, we had a uh, bacalhau bras in the in the in the menu. And That's in the right. meantime, there would, there would come uh, people coming from India or the, coming from Brazil, and oh, I want the bacalhau bras, and but they had their own take, or they, some of them could be nannies from the Soho. Uh, they That's right. A bit of a tradition of nan Portuguese uh, nannies. Um, in the Soho, and they would have their own take. They would add this, they would add that. Like, but even in Portugal, we kind of do our take a little bit, a little bit differently, and mainly with the herbal component, either cilantro or parsley, which normally right. in the north, the north, they're not crazy about the cilantro. They, they don't. If you say cilantro, they know you're coming from the south. So don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's, That's so it's true. correct. Yeah. It's correct. Extra. Their transition yep. a little bit. Okay, so I have the, uh, I have the cod. In your hand. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna talk about the olives. Awesome. Uh, really important stuff. This is something that we, we refine while uh, at La Badea, is um, the Portuguese recipe is literally, you're just taking whole olives and adding to the bacalhau bras at the end. We, we decided to refine it even more and 
our approach with things was always how to amplify the flavors of ingredients. And back in those years, we, you know, I was studying a lot of work of some French chefs, particularly Michel Bra, who was in the north of France. And he had his recipe where he was drying olives, um, getting a really intense uh, flavor out of them, pureeing them with oil. So we started playing around with that technique and started drying whole olives like I have here. You can basically do these at home uh, overnight while you're sleeping. Just put your oven on at the lowest setting, like 200 degrees. Uh, or if you have a dehydrator at home, you can use that as well. Whole pitted Kalamata olives, put them on a baking sheet, put them in the oven, and overnight they'll dry into like literally this almost chalky consistency where you can just break them up with your hands and they become like this powder. The oil is still present, but the beauty of it is that they take on this uh, really intense, almost chalky flavor uh, that really adds a whole other level to, the, to this very peasant uh, Portuguese dish. So all I'm doing is I'm taking the olives, I'm just breaking them up really rustically with my hands, and I'm gonna add it to the cod at this point, and then there's, I add more later on for the garnish on top, okay? So those go right into the pot like that. This is very cool that you do that. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like the, and you do this overnight for eight hours, nine hours? Depends on how long you sleep. So probably <laughs> uh, any, anywhere between six to 12 hours for all you sleepers out there. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that, again, this is such, just to talk about the history of this, it's so simple. It's very peasant ingredients, right? Cod, eggs, parsley, olive oil, and the cod. In, in, it's, it's literally the most simplest ingredients that you can gather, right? And it's about paying attention to every technique and then treating it with care and then putting your own little takes on, you know, how can it be better? You know, do I want to, what else can I add to the dish to take another level, but still staying true to the traditional, which is the basic ingredients of cod, potatoes, eggs, and olives, right? So at that point, I have a nice, great fragrance here from the olives and the cod. Off the heat, I'm gonna add my eggs, okay? I'm using about four whole eggs here. Gotta use a wooden spoon. And just start as if you're scrambling eggs over low heat. I feel every time that I cook this dish at home, like that's a, a little bit the trickier part for me. It makes sense, chef? Like the consistency, how you... Right, it's all about controlling the heat. You know, it's like my heat is at the lowest setting and I'll literally just slide okay. the pot off of the heat. And you can see that I'm, it's, it's still cooking. You can see the smoke rising, the steam rising off of the pot. I'm always in control of the heat. I can put it back on. Jeff, does this, does this recipe easily scale up if you were having a dinner party, let's say, and you wanted to serve more people? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Excellent. You know, the number of eggs up, it might be a good uh, Christmas Eve dish, just like Bruno said, you know, a lot of people eat seafood. Fantastic, absolutely. And to be very fair, I think the perception of what we think it is or not Thanksgiving, I think it's still a great dish for Thanksgiving too, because yeah. if you make a big a big uh, plate out of it, I think it's a very sharing thing. Um, you know, depending how our perception of Thanksgiving food or the that meal can be, I think it's a great dish for that matter. I think it's a great brunch dish as well. I think there's so there's so many things you can do with the dish. I think it's very social as well. That's right. So I just turn the heat off. And I'm there, right? It's still very moist. I always add a little bit more olive oil for another freshness of flavor. And then chopped parsley. We and then I have my crispy uh, shoestring potatoes going at the very those, end. Did they all come from one potato, Chef, or did you do uh, multiple potatoes for? for uh, that, that was, uh, I'm going to have a lot left over there of course <laughs> but that was about uh four small yukon gold potatoes cool okay cool. so that's basically the finished product i finished with a little bit of lemon juice as part of the seasoning to just kind of open everything up lemon juice is it's a, out of a fresh lemon don't buy that real lemon juice that comes in a plastic bottle just buy a buy a lemon cut it in half i had this fancy little lemon net that we get used at the restaurant 
so that none of the seeds go in there. Um, and it basically allows, it really opens up the flavor of the cod. It pushes the flavor of the olives forward, right? Um, and it just really brings the whole dish together. Now, just so I can put this aside, it's, it's still nice and creamy. I'm keeping it warm. And I'm gonna just wanna talk about the milk component of this because traditionally it's not part of a bacalao obrana's recipe, right? The, adding a milk component to it. Um, you can stop right there where I am now and just serve the bacalao obrana's as is. That's a traditional preparation. But to give another textural combo uh, component to the dish, I have some milk here that I infuse with all the scraps of the cod. What I mean is if you buy the cod, it has a skin on, you can cook it, peel the skin off, right? And add it to the milk and let it just infuse as if it was like a tea. Um, and you get a nice flavor of cod into the milk. And, if that, and then also what you can do, what's helping me kind of froth it as if I'm making a cappuccino is I added an egg yolk. And the natural protein from the egg yolk is allowing me to whisk it. It's giving the milk body and it's, it's creating this nice froth, if you will, on there, all right? And that's gonna come later in the dish. I'm gonna add some of this in, a codfish infused milk to the actual bucket of bras, like that, just to give it another creamy component. I'm adding more cod flavor because it has the flavor of the skins, right? And that's it, I'm ready to go and put this onto a plate. And this looks so good, George. So yeah, I have a plate here and here we go. Smells so good, I wish you guys were over here in Williamsburg with me. <laughs> it, it looks like the smell uh, brought in a, a furry friend to sneak uh, around and uh... <laughs> <laughs> had to make a little cameo. Of course. So, yeah. I mean, that is what, less than 15 minutes all in and how long does it take you to uh, fry the potatoes? About the same uh, time? Cutting, cutting and frying the potatoes, maybe about 12 minutes. The potatoes you can do up to two days before, right? You can right. just keep them in an airtight container. They stay nice and crispy. Um, so here is the, uh, the plate of bacalao bras, right? Beautiful. And then I'm going to, I have, look, the milk is still nice and frothy. So I'm gonna take that moussey texture, oh. right? And just go all the way around the cod. And then I'm gonna add more of the shoestring potatoes on top. And there you have it. So there's there's the, the bacalao bras Amazing. refined a little bit, but you know, really staying true and respecting the tradition of the recipe, you know, embellishing it a little bit, adding a few different textural components to it. Um, this recipe is in the book. I know the recipe also talks about using one of those siphons, the uh, CO2 cartridge uh, whipped cream maker things uh, that you can add the milk to and froth that up. It's also an easy step, but I just showed you a very you know, a MacGyver kind of a way to froth the milk at home using an egg yolk milk um, and a whisk. So um, you. there you have it. I'm gonna, really I'm gonna just try. The home cooking experience, you know, all the different versatile options that people mm. have to make this. Thank you so much for showing us that. Um, yeah. I, I will this, is my, this is my take. This is what nice. I... Uh, Beautiful olive. So it's really nice. I haven't eaten that dish in a long time. And the burst of olives from drying them, and then the cod really comes together and takes the dish to another level. So I really hope all the viewers can do that technique at home. It really makes a world of difference. And I noticed, Jeff, that you don't need to add any salt because you have the salt already from the fish. No, exactly. The, the fish already has a salinity to it. Mm -hmm. um, the olives also contribute, right? Um, the lemon juice opens it up. I mean, there's different regions of Portugal that um, will not even soak the cod. So it becomes even more salty, right? Sure. I also know people that will add, you know, taste is subjective and people have different uh, thresholds of salt in their food, right? So I think that, um, you know, it's, it's personal preference and how much uh, if you want to add salt or not. Well, I will give you a quick plug for your cookbook. It's the beautiful cookbook. Uh, and Thank you. you. Actually, you give a shout out to one of our co-founders, Rui Abacaziz, who uh, you got to hang out with uh, in Portugal. And there's a fun story about you two uh, in that book. We are actually yeah. 
giveaway later. We'll tell you about it. We're going to give away a few sets of the cookbook so that people who are here tonight can have a chance to win so they have it in their own homes. Um, yep. One of the olives, you know, speaking of the olives, one of the reasons why people were really excited, uh, Chef, the tasting that you did with your sommelier at Veranda uh, was the Torriga Nacional. So that was something that really jumped out with you two for pairing uh, was a red wine. So Bruno, I'd love to hear your take on the Torriga with this dish since you made it your, yourself at home too. <laughs> um, definitely, like the, believe, uh, those like those elements in a dish make, uh, make a huge difference. Like I'm talking about the, the parsley component, the olive, the olive component. And something that I would like to mention actually with olive and olive oil in Portugal, it's massive. We are like crazy about olive oil and we have beautiful uh, um, bottlings of olive oil right now, like single varietal um, uh, olive um, bottlings and a lot of actually, a lot of producers, wineries are actually coming up with great um, olive oil. So it's not easy to find in the US, but there's a few that you can find. I highly recommend you that. And then the thing about the dish that uh, every time that I've been going to Portugal is very interesting that coming from place to place, it's something that I really found, I really find that it's been helping or it's been very holding hands and aligned with Portuguese winemaking. It's the fact that Portugal has a very welcoming country, like we've been welcoming different backgrounds and different uh, ethnicities and people coming from other places that all of a sudden like these same people are start working in a restaurant, start like being sous chefs and they bring their own take or they start opening their own restaurants and they make the dish with a little take coming from where they're coming from. And I think that's been helping a lot of wine producers in Portugal and the new generation of winemakers understanding like different possibilities in food can open different possibilities in wine. They're traveling more, they're visiting other countries, they're tasting different foods, they're doing internships in New Zealand, Chile, Napa. So they're tasting different foods. I think the food element and the tourism element in Portugal has opened up the palate with wine as well, opening up the conversation a little more. About Turiga Nacional. Turiga Nacional, like, so the first uh, we're going to be uh, talking, actually, we're going to have, we're going to head to the Douro. We have uh, Masinita, our duo. Uh, very energetic, very energetic um, brother and sister. Uh, I love the energy that had been make, came, coming up during the pandemic. They kept me awake a lot of times. They kept me uh, uh, watching their conversation. So it's uh, beautiful like to see the synergy that they have together. But uh, definitely, uh, definitely Joana is very proud of like and very um, uh, embracing like the true core of what the Doro is, understanding the people, understanding the region, understanding the plant, understanding the vine. So we have a great example of how Turiga Nacional shows up with a little bit of Sozan. We have about 55% uh, Turiga Nacional and the remaining with Sozan. What Turiga Nacional brings, brings a little bit of violet, a little bit of bergamot, uh, but very always very floral. But it always has this kind of little bit of zestiness um, uh, on the palate, uh, a little bit of orange. So it has a little great acidity that can cut through a little bit of fat and actually works well with the dish itself, either we're thinking about eggs and even on the other, uh, in the other style of the dish that chef, that chef is making with, the, with the, the dairy component on the dish. But so the acidity works really well. So this is a fresh, great, clean expression of, uh, of um, a Torriga Nacional blend for a lot. So when we think about Todoro, so we are right here, but actually, Toriga Nacional comes from the region where we're going to talk on the next one, comes from the down. Um, it's really, a, it's a flagship in the Douro, but actually the main grape in the Douro Valley is actually Toriga Franca. That's the big, most important variety for both steel uh, and uh, fortified wines. But uh, yes, in here, like what we get, like we get, again, beautiful acidity, freshness, um, very floral aromas, a lot of red fruit, bergamot, um, uh, rhubarb, uh, raspberries, a uh, little bit of pomegranate. And, and it's a wine that is super fresh. Yes, we can think about some roasted meats. We can think about some uh, roasted sausages. But in our culture as well in Portugal, as I mentioned before, the, um, the culture of drinking uh, white wines, it's fairly new to us. Like in the last 20, 30 years, we start drinking more white wines. So for a long time, you've always been used to drink red wines, like more on the lighter style of that. So now we see like 
a little lighter uh, lighter styles of red wines like this is another one this is one of them that bringing more a balance in terms of the pairing wines that are more social ones that can be, be drink on its own but it can bring not only thinking about the protein over and over and over we can think about other things outside of the protein like the olives we can think about the parsley and not necessarily things so focus on the cod so this is definitely a great expression how doro can be that versatile and we across across the region this is in the simacorgo simacorgo it's right in the middle it's basically splitting three uh, sub regions and simacorgo is right in the middle um where you find a little more when it starts to get like a little more uh, more concentrated wines uh but it starts to get a little more warmer as you're not as close um on the up on the lower corridor uh, close to the to the coast so this is high elevation as well so that's super important the sense of place uh, as any place in the world and mainly in the doro that there's such difference of um of temperatures from the lower parts of the closer to the river and then when you go up and this has been a little bit of the pursuit of winemakers mainly the doro to look for the best spot where they can achieve all the elements of acidity purity of fruit and we're talking about like these vines are fairly old i think about like 70 from what i remember my conversation with you mm -hmm. but 70 85 year old vines so that's a lot that's a lot when you go to alentejo this is like a lot a lot like you go to alentejo it's probably like 40 year old vines that that's old vines in the door that's basically when we talk about old vines 80 up to even 100 i think uh Masanita, they have a few wines that are even over uh, even canivets i think they're over uh 100 years old i think yeah i think close yeah. to <laughs> even in one case yeah joanna uh so the winemaker joanna masanita and she does make this wine with her brother antonio and, and bruno knows both of them they're really part of the new portugal this young energetic wave just like bruna described um incredible winemakers great people great social media you should definitely check them out and see what they're up to but joanna has been working in the doro and has been sourcing uh really special vineyards that she has to kind of convince these old school farmers to uh to work with her on and so she's she's convinced them and we're so thrilled we've gotten this wine i think this is the third or fourth vintage that we've been able to import it and so it's really fun to pair tonight um, you know, Bruno, you said something that I really loved, which was versatility of Toriga Nacional and of these reds. You know, with Thanksgiving coming up and everybody eats different things, you know, do you think either of these would be make sense on the table for a uh, Thanksgiving meal? I tasted, I tasted before, I tasted it before the wine, so I have a few ideas like in mind, but I'm now I'm thinking a little bit like in a, in a consensual way, like how a chef did the dish and incorporating that um, dairy element on a dish. But for instance, like right now, it makes it's totally fine. Like I would like once I heard about the wines, I would think like oh, it's going to be challenging, but I like I love challenge, I like challenges. But again, this expression of the Doro, and let's not always think about like despite like right now in Portugal, it's, be, it's been very focused on monovarietal wines. Yes, I truly believe in that factor because if we make better monovarietal wines, we're going to make better blending wines and that's the true core of portuguese wines it's the art of blending but if we understand the sense of place sense of vineyard like the vineyards from the asnella the very specific spot if we understand the the the, the grape itself and where it's coming from we make better wine so this is a great expression of a doro wine this still screams a doro wine and the expression of itself it's very clean it's fresh it doesn't overwhelm the dish for a red wine thinking about even the dairy component or the egg component it works totally well one of the Moving things we wanted to share with everyone tonight is to not be afraid of red wines with fish you know with more delicate dishes i know patrick you're from spain you know you eat you eat fish a lot and also you know don't have a fear of red wine with fish uh, Chef George, I know you tasted the wines in advance, um, and so curious to hear your thoughts if you were if you were tasting along, uh, you know, reds with fish. It's something every Portuguese does, and we're so we're so excited to have these kind of fresher takes to keep everything light and lifted with the richness of this. And a lot of reds, a lot of reds that uh, Antonio makes uh, with Fita Preta, for instance, like the Toriga Nua, like you know, the, that expression of the Toriga. Some of his wines, and even the wines coming from the Zoris wine company, some of those reds, they can totally go with the grilled fish. Of course, when you're thinking about these reds, a little bit like more in the fatty style of the fish. Um, but again, not only let's not think a lot about the protein, but what kind of 
garden niche do we have? Is that sweet potatoes, herb potatoes? Is that asparagus? Is that artichokes? And then the sauce, is that a, um, a bourguignon? Is that a, a, what kind of sauce is that? Is that a bechamel? Is that a, a red port reduction? Is that actually just a vinaigrette, like a balsamic? So a lot of times we focus a little bit on, on the protein and we forget that reds in Portugal is coming up with very fresh, lower alcohol reds going back to the time. And um, uh, great producers like in the in the same in the same uh, group that uh, the, the Masanita brothers are, are going right now, this new generation of winemaking, they're thinking, yes, wines to be with food, but most and foremost, wines to be fun to drink with. Like funds that wines that you can just drink it by itself and can socialize. So a lot of red wines, light red wines are coming up out of Portugal right now. Totally, totally. Yeah, I think that's a yeah. key element, no? The that they're not very tannic wines, so they go they pair really well with fish. No, most most mm. of the times people think red wines go with with meat because of the tannic structure. No, that can help you, you know, um, digest the protein on the meat. But when you're dealing with light reds, they can pair extremely beautifully well. No, with with fish. I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts about if we were to deconstruct this dish. Right, we have the milk. Uh, we have the olives, we have the cod, we have the fishiness of the of the cod, the salinity. If we were to deconstruct this plate, what are the elements that make it pair so well with Toriga Nacional? Because you know you can have milk and Toriga Nacional, and maybe that's not such a good pairing. You know, you can have uh, the cod on its own with the salinity, and and maybe it's not such a good pairing with Toriga Nacional. It, it, it's definitely gonna work, but it's not gonna amplify the flavors of, of the fish. In, in, in what, what areas do you think, what, what ingredients do you think are the ones that really make this dish you know, dance with, with Toriga? I think, the anchor, I think the anchor is the black olive. Gotta be honest with you, I think the drying, drying out the olive and making it really intense and taking on that chocolatey cocoa nut to um, the nuttiness to the, uh, to the dish. Uh, the olive becomes a strong anchor to matching with the red for me. I was just tasting it, and I, one thing I was thinking about, like, like, why does this red work? And the first thing that came to mind and on my palate was the olives, and that really brought it together. Then the potatoes, mm -hmm. and then the cod. The cod is has a nice backbone and foundation to absorb it and to handle it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and a lot of things like we need to understand like where Torrigenacional comes from, and we still think that Torrigenacional is actually a very tannic wine. It's actually not like totally depend where it's coming from. We have to understand like for instance, Portugal right now, they have about like I think 25 to 30 different clones of Torriga Nacional. So as Pinot Noir and other varieties that we love, Torriga Nacional needs a sense of place where it's planted. So we need to understand what is being planted, what kind of clone, what clone is suited to a different climate, microclimate altitude. So this thing that I think that Portuguese uh, winemaking has been learning with food and white winemaking is being the same thing with reds. They're starting to understand like we need to figure out like where to better to plant a lenteja, for instance. To recognize from formal lenteja can be a little more broody, more powerful. Would I say probably with cod? Perhaps not. But when we go like to regions like this beautiful bottle, Quinta de Sainz from down, when we think about Dal as a huge tradition with the Burgundian field, Burgundian monks, Cistician monks went in the 1200s. But in the meantime, they brought like the finesse of winemaking a lot. So when you think about Portugal and, and Dal, it's a Burgundian, like it's the Burgundy of Portugal for that sense of finesse and elegance. So elegance coming through uh, with Torriga Nacional, where that's the origin of Torriga Nacional from the little town, the little village of Torigo by Viseu and Quinta de Sainz, they are by the, um, they're in the northern part. So they're in a very cool plateau. They're by the Caramulo, by the, they're facing the, the winds coming from, from the Serra de Estrela. So we're thinking about like, you know, of course we have a great winemaker, one of the best winemakers in Portugal, with Alvaro Crash, which he understands the sense of place, he understands the terroir by bringing the best out of the variety. And we're thinking about red wines a lot with that tannin structure. We think a lot of times, I, I, uh, the other time I was like, oh, I would love a Torrigan with some like a spicy chili. No, you know, like, because there's enough 
tannin at times to the Guinness, you know, depending what it's coming from with spicy foods can clash. That's more of an issue for me. Spicy foods and foods like that, tannic quites, Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, Syrah, that with spicy foods can be a little bit of an issue. Over here, we have 100% uh, uh, Turrican National, again, uh, from the origins of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of the Down region. So totally that elegance, beautiful acidity, um, mostly on, uh, this is like granite, like in, when we think about the Down, it's right here. It's like when we starting to go a little bit down, but it's in the center north of the region, close to the highest um, mountains that we have in Portugal, like the Serra de Estrela, which they make a beautiful cheese, the Serra de, Serra de Estrela, creamy, uh, hard, uh, soft, creamy um, uh, cheese. Um, but over here, like again, the acidity like cuts through, makes a great link with, with the olives. And uh, like, there's a little bit of that kind of lavender bergamot on the nose. It's very traditional in the region. Like, of course, Alvaro Cash is going to bring that. But, but this spends about 24, uh, months in uh, in French oak in the previous wine actually spends about 12 months of aging, but 50% in uh, stainless steel and 50% in stainless steel and then the other 50% in neutral and new oak. So that's the other part too. Back in the time down was overwhelming oak in their wines. And nowadays it's totally the opposite. Milk, really quickly, uh, I want to just pause this conversation really quickly and uh, let Sam uh, sign off on behalf of World Central Kitchen. He's got a small person in his life that he's got to put to bed. Uh, we want to hear one little last bit from him. And then after Sam leaves, we're going to bring everybody on and keep this roundtable going, hear more thoughts on uh, this wine from, from Bruno and ask some, questions, some more questions to Chef. So Sam. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, this has been an incredible session. Thank you guys both, um, Chef Mendez and Bruno, for, for supporting this work and all of you. Um, this has been, uh, I, I, I don't know a lot about Portuguese cooking and wine, so this has been a great lesson for me. Um, I just wanted to kind of give you a very quick update on what we're doing right now. Um, very nearby Portugal, actually, we're working in the Canary Islands. Um, another very um, like very impressive wine uh, wine territory, but La Palma, there was a volcano about a month ago and the islands pretty much split in two. And Jose was there um, for about a week. Our team has continued to cook for first responders. And it's been a really intense work there for the past few weeks because the, um, because the volcano was so bad. I, I encourage you, if you don't know about it, uh, if you don't follow Jose on Twitter, Follow him on Twitter. He's a, a great follow at Chef Jose Andres. But he was making these videos right in front of the volcano, as if it was like, you know, on fire right behind his face. So go check those out. Um, and I really appreciate all your work. We're at WCK WCK WC Kitchen on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and again, Chef Mendez, thank you so much for choosing World Central Kitchen for supporting us. Thank you so much, Bruno, for. The, the lesson and the wine. I've been enjoying the Turiga uh, for the past hour. It's really opening up right now. It's really nice. Um, and thank you again to Ole and Obrigado, uh, Patrick, Aaron, and the team for your continual and long support of WCK. Uh, WCK. So thanks again, all. Thank, thank you, much. Sam. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you thank for you. what you guys do. And, and I wanted to ask one last question. Um, so now that we've, we've done a little bit of, um, of breaking down no, this dish. I, I, I would think that if we work with olives and chicken, for example, that will be a great pairing with Toriga Nacional. No, if we do a pasta dish, perhaps with, with some olives in this shape also. Uh, so I think that's, well, I, I would like to hear your thoughts on that, uh, Chef Mendez, because I think, you know, we wanna help people also play with the wines and understand what are the key ingredients no? that, that play, play well with, with, um, with this ingredient of, of dry olives? Sure, I mean, you can definitely uh, utilize chicken, you can use pork, um, you can utilize duck. I mean, it's, it's so versatile and so many opportunities here. Um, I think uh, even, even robust uh, earthy vegetables, root vegetables, like grilled vegetables can go if you're for all the vegans and vegetarians out there, I think, um, you know, a, a nice assembly of, of, of vegetables that are possibly even seasoned with olives and olive oil can go really well with this wine. Um, it, you know, the, the beauty of it is that 
like Bruno was saying, it's very low in alcohol. Um, it's, it's very fruity. Um, it, it really opens up to a lot of different pathways for in terms of what you can pair it with and what you want to eat. Um, but yeah, of course, chicken, pork, lamb for that. For, I mean, it, possibilities are almost endless. Right. You know, it, it's, it's something that there's no rules here, you know? I think one thing that I don't really like to do with Torigan is not actually mushrooms. Um, mushrooms and Torigenes mushrooms. with mushrooms. I think uh, as that great quality uh, to work with. I think it's a very mushroom driven. Of course, like with age, I uh, think the part like going like to the season that we love so much with truffles, like Torigenes, you know, our wines coming from the down go really well with mushrooms and truffle pastas and all that beauty that we all love. And something that I'm tasting, you know, and there's a little savory note to it. So there's a little savory quality to it that makes it even more open-minded in terms of the, not only the dish, but other possibilities. We just got a great comment from, from Jeffrey that duck rice, duck rice would be really good uh, with, with this one. <laughs> Um, if I weren't eating, I would be starving. I'm so glad <laughs> to hear all these dishes. We did have a question, Chef, about the milk. If there's anything you recommend doing after simmering the cod or if you should just toss it. Uh, the audience also wants to be sure that you're using Portuguese olive oil. <laughs> <they're asking. laughs> um, and while you explain that, we're going to actually switch on the settings that will allow everyone <laughs> they want in the audience to come on camera. So Bruno, George, Patrick, so we can see you um, because we're we're loving all this feedback and we want to see your faces if you want to join us. So I'm going to turn yeah, that sure. on. Yeah, sure. Of course. So I mean, the 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 reason why I decided to utilize the milk in the recipe uh, basically came about. Um, there's a version in my cookbook that serves it as a little snack, and we serve the bacalhau bras in a little carved out egg. We break, uh, we carve the top of the egg off. We make the bacalhau bras, and then we very carefully spoon it back into the eggshell and serve it with a lot a little tiny spoon. We had that on the menu at Aldea for probably five or six years from 2009 onwards. Um, and we wanted a, a, an, elegant, an elegant velvety topping. And we were messing around with milk and we decided, okay, so we're, we're cooking the cod in milk and what's a way to utilize it. And that's how it became a topping to the egg dish. And then from there, we started using it in a plated version as well. So again, for those uh, people, uh, that are joining us that are on screen with us. We, um, there were some questions on how I got it to froth is I basically started with about one and a half cups of milk and one egg yolk, both cold. And as it started coming, as I warmed it up over medium low heat, I began to whisk. And then naturally the proteins, the soy proteins from the egg began to uh, slightly thicken the milk. And also I was able to froth it. And right now it's pretty like just below room temperature. And you can see I'm whisking it again and it's coming back up. I can have a really strong froth again. So as far as applications go, uh, I mean, for the cod is different variations on, on uh, cod preparations. It makes sense, right? If you're doing uh, this dish with the eggs and the potato and the parsley, or if you're doing other traditional Portuguese dishes uh, using cod, the milk can play a component. Uh, possibilities are endless. Um, or, I mean, you can get really creative and, and just start going your own journeys at home with how to utilize this cod infused milk, right? I don't, I don't think I would recommend putting it in your cappuccino early in the morning, but you know, hey, if for those that want some cod flavor in their coffee, why not? That's a commitment <laughs> to Portugal right there. <laughs> well, we do have- we For, do all, have, your, for, uh, all, your, one for all your purists out there. We do have one cod dish for each day of the year, so. That's right. <laughs> Amazing. I think there's a cod museum too somewhere in Portugal, I think. Um, there's restaurants based in cod in Portugal, actually. There's yeah. like at least one that is like by uh, not very far from the airport, um, by Cardo Orient, and it's from the big family of the Ribeir Alves, um, the big family that are like in Lisbon. And the, the whole restaurant is just cod. There's different styles of cod. It's just, I was I was uh, planning to show I have this beautiful roasted cod oh, yeah. in conserva form because I was cheating tonight uh, and and didn't and didn't soak my cod finish soaking my cod in time so I, I'm messing around with that tasting it with the wines and it's super fun. Um, if everyone here is so into Portugal and Portuguese cuisine, we want to entice you with a little giveaway. So I'm going to explain that in just a minute, um, and I think we can even share you as on the screen. So. This is our 12th experience, as Patrick mentioned, and I know that some of you 
are uh, regulars of ours on the series, and we want to thank you so much for joining us once a month for these incredible chats. Some of you are new, uh, and we welcome you with open arms, and we want to see you come back. And so one of the things that we always do is we send an email to everyone who bought a ticket after the end of the session. You're going to get the recording of this, so you can watch it again as you're at your leisure if you need to review the technique or even share it with a friend. Um, and in our follow-up email tonight, we're going to have a little uh, couple trivia questions for you. And so about something, uh, some part of the demonstration that uh, Chef has done for us tonight. You have until 5 p.m. Eastern tomorrow to respond. And we are going to do a random drawing for three people. Two people will each receive a copy of My Portugal Recipes and Stories by George Mendez, which is this incredible cookbook that Chef published. And so you can keep exploring his cuisine and recipes at home, find another use for that cod milk, perhaps, who knows. Um, so we're going to be sending two people that. And then we got a really fun prize for one lucky winner, which is actually a three pack of wines from a different Portuguese winery that we represent, which is in Bairrada, which is a region we haven't covered tonight, although we have covered a lot of ground. Um, they are very uh, amazing at cellaring wines, and we have some really cool vintages, 94, 85, 96, in our cellar at Olé and Obrigado. So we're going to send someone a three-pack of these very special wines. So all you have to do is respond to our email, um, and make sure you subscribe to our email so you know about the next, the next experiences. Also, in that follow-up email, we're going to be linking you to um, Bruno's uh, Instagram page, to this incredible article that he wrote about Vigne Verde recently. Um, we're going to send you a link to uh, make a reservation at Veranda so you can go see Chef George in person and tell him uh, whatever it is that you did with your cod milk, if you found a magical solution. And like I said, that recording. So you'll see that in your inbox later on tonight. All you have to do is reply to that email by 5 p.m. tomorrow, and you could be in the running to win this excellent cookbook or this really fun uh, package of wines that we think you should also explore with all of your food. So. At this point in the night, you know, some of you have come on camera. Thanks for joining us. Um, we want to make sure that we have a little toast. So maybe Patrick, do you want to lead us in a, in a toast or Bruno um, and teach us how to say cheers in Portuguese. Portuguese is a beautiful language. It's not always the easiest. So maybe a little demonstration would help us all uh, become experts. Saúde. <laughs> Saúde. I'm gonna I'm gonna let people turn on their uh, turn on their mics if they want to unmute themselves because this is the part of the night where we get lots of great questions. So um, one more time for us, please, Bruno. So would. So would. Cheers. 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 Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you so much, George. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Sam, for what you guys do, and thank you everyone for joining. We look forward to the next one. Uh, we're gonna do on our next episode, uh, uh, black, black Paella. So this is um, a good one and pairing with uh, whites and reds as well. So this will be an interesting episode. Uh, black Paella is one of the most quintessential paella dishes of Spain. A lot of people don't know about this, but it's absolutely different from the Valenciana Paella and so delicious. Great to see you, everyone. Yeah. Thank nice you. to see you. Nice Thank to see you, Patrick. Free. Thank you so much, Erin. Oh, yes. Thank you so much, Erin. We can't Thank wait to see you. Thank you, Chef. I'll see you sometime soon, Chef. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks you. So much, everyone. Thanks for coming on camera. I got my Chicago folks. Thank you all. Jeffrey Ryan, Jeffrey McDowell. Look, Jeffrey McDowell, you've got your cookbook. You're set up. Look at that. Jeffrey, you have the cookbook with you. Oh, yeah. Yes. When did you get the book? I've had it for a couple of years. Excellent. That's great. I use it occasionally with other Portuguese and Spanish cookbooks. That's great. That's we awesome. Have, we have way too many, but never mind. <laughs> there, there, is, there is no such a thing with cookbooks. You know, there is so much uh, good stuff out there and so much good inspiration. Mm. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> That's great. Eric, did you make the dish? <clears throat> I didn't finish this time, but Patrick is getting me really excited about next time. So I think I'm going to have to put my apron on him for, for next uh, episode. Yeah, yeah, you have to do that. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you from North Carolina. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.
Bruno, I'm so impressed that you you made the dish in advance with everything else. You're, you're <laughs> busy. You're a busy man right now. No, you know, like it's it's something that a lot of times I wake up like in Sundays and I just like you open you open your fridge it's just like boom 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 and like just like chef said it's like a very peasant kind of style like you use what you have on the, on, on the pantry on the fridge and uh but i'm i'm gonna do it with uh dehydrating the olives and i think in a lot of different things i mm -hmm. like that idea of dehydrating the olives it just opens up again that that link that makes with the one but even elevates um, dishes a lot i worked in um in an event uh actually based in a recipe from chef a carne de porc alentejana which is cubed fried uh pork of course portuguese style pork with uh, with uh, with uh, potatoes and just the element of the um, adding uh, just a little bit of uh, of the cilantro on top made a huge difference in different aspects and um, the perception of what we think uh, mm -hmm. of the dish and other pairing ideas so i'm always curious about adding other elements to a dish like like we did with dehydrating the olives. I think it's super fun. I will definitely- Yeah, that was great. Bruno, I'm very curious about where you got that t-shirt. I want one of those. That's true. People yeah, are I've, been making, I've been making a few t-shirts. You can, you can check my uh, my Instagram, but yeah, I'm gonna come up with some more. So that's, that's how I've been doing great. my virtual education. I've been like pointing, instead of coming with maps or like stuff on the screen. Like, so I just- that's good. I like it. Uh, you you have to send me the link. I want to buy some of those. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I'm sure they said this, but I missed it. What restaurant do you work at? Well, before uh, the challenging times, I was working at Tocqueville, which actually uh, I met, I came across with Tocqueville in the early 2000s when I landed in, in, the, in the US in 2002. Then I start like I landed as a musician, but being a musician in arts doesn't pay bills. So I start working in restaurants, and I start working in um, in the Soho. And then I came across with actually with chef in came to the restaurant that I was working because he was doing some consulting at this Portuguese restaurant. And at that time he was working at Tocqueville. He was one of the first chefs at Tocqueville. It's located on uh, by Union Square in New York City. And then in 2006. I ended up at Tocqueville, but he was already at Aldaya. So we crossed paths a little bit, but I was at Tocqueville. Yes. No, so I'm... if we come to New York, there's nowhere for us to see you now. Uh, at the moment, uh, no, I'm freelancing, doing a lot of uh, connecting to people across the world and writing, and sharing my passion. With, uh... Yeah. We're so, there's we're there's so thankful that you're here. There's great Spanish food in Florida, so you should think about us. <laughs> well, so that's, a strong, that's a strong community of Portuguese, no, mostly in the northern part of Florida, West Palm Beach. That, that's a strong Portuguese community there. Yeah. I'm a related to a few here in Tampa. Okay. <laughs> nice. Well, for such a small country, Portugal produces so many incredible diverse dishes, uh, and we're so glad that we got to learn about this one tonight. So. Chef, thank you again so much for being here. Um, and we hope to see all of you again in the future uh, at another experience. Thank you. And let's, let's do this again sometime. And thank you so much. We're going to bid you good evening and go finish eating our, our dishes that we made. Yeah. Thank good you. Night. So Thanks, you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Much. Bruno, thank you for your time. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Obrigado. 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 Bruno. Obrigado. Chef, chef. Obrigado.